Well, we have about 20 minutes for a question and answer period. I'll take five questions at a time as before, and then we'll see what our panelists can. Can we get the microphone? Do we have the Hi, um, I want to thank all the speakers for everything that they've said and given a lot of us a lot to think about in the organizers of this conference and this day in particular. I just kind of want to meditate on Janine Hassan kind of ended on with this idea of Canada using these LGBTQ refugees in particular to forward a specific Islamophobic agenda. I kind of want to push that a little further in that Iran using these refugees as a way to justify potential war, potential extracting of resources in Iran, etc. I'd love to hear some more meditations on the links between, between those two, um, as you did cite. One thing um, in particular that I'm interested in and trying to figure out as it came out this summer was that in June, a group of ad hoc uh, Iranian Canadian human rights advocates, uh, without the consultation of many Iranian Canadians in the left, um, through months of organizing and meetings with different Canadian MPs from all three parties, somehow got to, not somehow, but got to the House of Commons to put forward um, a motion that Canada acknowledge the massacre of Iranian political prisoners in 1988 as an act of um, human rights violations and an act of atrocity. And in that process, they also got September 3rd, as a day of Canadian solidarity with Iranian political prisoners. And I just want to kind of think about that irony as in Canada we see the mass incarceration of indigenous people, the mass incarceration of racialized people, the increasing incarceration of refugees and undocumented people, and what it means for a diasporic community to ask the Canadian government to have a day of solidarity with Iranian political prisoners when we have such high problems with the prison industrial complex here in Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the young lady in the back, please. Can I ask you to please keep your comments to uh, about a minute so that we can get as many questions in as possible? Yes. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to all the speakers as well, and I will try to keep this as uh, short and succinct as possible. Uh, but I really wanted to pose this question uh, to the panel because a couple, um, just in terms of the monk school's affiliation with reaction, very um, sort of reactionary, religious, fundamental groups, um, a lot, I think in the last year or so it was, I started attending uh, a series that the monk school for global affairs was holding on Turkey. And they had um, talks about Fethullah Gulen movement, for those of you who are familiar with it, also uh, the, uh, the AKP party and the Kurdish issue. Anyways, I attended these talks and I was absolutely shocked. I also had some friends there, though, um, we were absolutely shocked because it was basically a promotion of the Fethullah Gulen movement. Um, it was, it praised the movement, it was completely uncritical. Um, they were handing out pamphlets about having iftar dinner all together and praising, it, it was very, it was so bizarre and just in that kind of setting, in that academic, I mean, so basically my question is, is one, are you familiar with this kind of, this relationship with the Fethullah Gulen movement and the Monk School for Global Affairs, and if not, what would you, I mean, it seems like it would oh connect with kind of the relationship that they have with Iran as well in some ways, I'm not too sure. Okay. Other questions? Okay, why don't we start with those and people can um, let it marinate at the same time. Why don't we start from that end and work our way back, if possible, Said. So, I think, yes, absolutely. I think through you know, Canadian usage of uh, LGBTQ communities as a way to sort of further its warmongering agenda. We've seen this in a number of places. I mean, we're seeing um, Canada sort of do these sort of like selective um, um, selective um, acceptances from particular countries, but not from others. So we see huge number of human rights, but they would talk about housing protection. So yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a multi, it's multiple impacts, right? One is it paints those things as exceptions, 
that Canada is not part of. And then simultaneously, it creates the ability for Canada to go to war on those issues in the future. I mean, we saw this in the case of Afghanistan, where you know the West went to save the Afghani women, right? That sort of nonsense narrative um, is being replayed. What I really want to sort of suggest is how do I mean, like, one way, like we, you know, I was posing the question. One of the ways we've tried to talk about these issues is to say yes, um, we don't want deportations to Iran or whichever country because of the treatment of individuals there. But we simultaneously want to question Canadian complicity, Canadian responsibility in creating those conditions here. So it's all goes about talking about both of those things at the same time. Now, it comes down to a very pragmatic question, and the pragmatic question is, when you're trying campaigning for individual rights, when you're trying to campaign one deportation at a time, you have to pose every case as an exception. Right? Because there's, you can't system, if you go systematically say we oppose all deportations, it's going to be very difficult. So when I was trying to put out that multiple diaspora activists who weren't trying to stop deportations have sort of fallen into it, I don't want to whitewash it. I don't want to be like, oh yes, they're wrong, there's a right way. In fact, it's a complex question. So we really need to deal with these on a case-by-case -case basis. I just want to comment on the, um, the Gulen movement. Uh, well, there's a by quote against uh, Mark School. Uh, I just finished my graduate studies at U of D, and I, I, I've been following the list of these talks, but never attended uh, any of them. Uh, and I recommend no one. <laughs> so, I, but I guess uh, this is part of an agenda for uh, for the Middle East. Like uh, um, we know, like the recent developments in Turkey uh, about this uh, corruption issues, and. Uh, um, Apparently, the West they clearly support uh, uh, the uh, Gulenists or Fatulachis in Turkey. So probably I, I will connect that to uh, to this. But uh, I'm sure uh, Sekura can comment if you have any. Okay. Actually, I, I wasn't aware of that. But um, you know, seeing that you know, especially now that Naylor has been named to the board of directors of Barrett Gold. Um, I would love to just talk to you more about it and maybe write an article for Monk at a U of T because, you know, just given their track record, the things that I've become aware of, you know, is, you know, Monk supporting a certain, um, you know, foreign policy abroad, you know, in terms of, I showed the example of the Afghan war conference, um, you know, and of course, uh, supporting CETA being folded into, um, you know, the war and, um, trade agenda. Um, I think that the LGBT deportee question, um, the, you know, allying with Canada to support LGBT deportees is a really interesting thing. And I think that, you know, it's a lesson in how we should frame solidarity. Um, so I think it would be amazing, for example, if LGBT groups in Iran were to support other uh, LGBT community members that are being deported to Mexico. So, for example, I just, I think that everything that Hassan and also, you know, what everyone here has been saying is that the Canadian state is not someone that you want to ally with. You know, so any allyship, you know, it might seem really powerful and huge to get Parliament to pass, you know, this day of international solidarity, um, but that's likely going to be twisted for their own agenda. And, um, you know, more than just um, an agenda of imperialism, um, you know, there is the issue of uh, natural resources as well. And something that I promised to talk to about in my talk that I didn't really talk about is CETA's history of rewriting mining codes in other countries. So it's happened in Colombia and it's happened most recently in Honduras. And so with this recent change in CETA being folded into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Development, um, I think that we can expect to see more of that. And in fact, there is an entire um, university initiative that was sponsored by CETA, whose entire point is to convince countries not to nationalize their resources. And that's a partnership with UBC, um, Simon Fraser University, and Quebec's um, Ecole Polytechnic Institute. Mm -hmm. and so. Wow, holy, okay. Well, first of all, I never knew what the monk school was until <laughs> we all spoke. <laughs> So, uh, I learned a lot, actually. And so I think of, of well, you know, for me, I, everybody's an immigrant. 
I mean, you know, we know that, you know, you came to, people came to our shores a long time ago and came ashore and we took care of them. You know, it's the same as in the Americas, you know, that they were well looked after and greeted by those of us who lived, both my ancestor comes from here, right? I don't have to go across the waters to find mine. And I, and I, I just go, what, what are you talking about? You're kicking people out of this country because they're, um, because they're lesbian or gay or whatever the, the you know those alphabet letters mean, and and you're kicking them out, you're sending them back to Mexico, and you're not sending them back to Ryan because you're using them as you know a way to fight a war. When I'm like, oh my God, and you know our women are dying here in this country, and Harper doesn't give a crap because he doesn't even want to do a national inquiry for Native women and missing and murdered women, right? I mean, I don't know how people who don't speak English don't understand what that man is saying. You know, like, I mean, you know, I read some of the things about when he came back from overseas in Israel, I was like, really? <laughs> like, you actually have the guts not to stand up in another country and say the things you say? And it's accepted to be like, you know, he's the greatest thing since sliced bread when, I, you know, I just think that he needs to go, right? And, uh, you know, and I hear all of you, and I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, there's a whole other thing happening on this planet, on this place that I never knew about, so I'm busy fighting for other things that we need to be involved in. I mean, it felt good to be able to hear that you acknowledge the territories of the, of the Native people or the Aboriginal people or Indigenous, they don't even know what to call us these days, right? <laughs> and so, whatever you call us, it's okay as long as you call us, you know? So, that you recognize that. I didn't know you were at Bella's Memorial, you know, there are lots of people there, and, I, and I think that that's the key, right? You know, and if you, if you mention to them at the same time that you're mentioning to them all those other things about the immigration, that you're not even looking after your women here. You know, because Harper doesn't care, and he stated that publicly, and you know, um, he won't, won't do a national inquiry, you know, um, and his whole agenda has been not to assimilate us, but I think annihilate us. You know, like get get rid of us. <laughs> you know, they tried the assimilation thing and it didn't work. Um, so now they're going. All right, the six. You know, the white paper didn't happen in '69, so now we'll just you know pretend they don't exist. And as as all those things we promised them, if we don't give it to them, they're definitely going to die now. You know, because when we leave our reserves and we come to the cities, they tell us that we're no longer indigenous to this country because we don't live on the reserve land that they put aside for us. So that apartheid that, you know, I mean, I was, I was glad that, I mean, no, I wasn't glad. I was really shocked that he went to Mandela's, Della's, uh, you know, funeral and memorial and all those things, right? And I'm thinking, right, you get, you know, the apartheid came from here. You know, and, and you're talking about what a wonderful man, which he was. I mean, you know, he's an inspiration, and, and but yet the Harper government goes over there and does that when, you know, they come back and our people are dying right here in the streets of Toronto because they don't have homes. Okay. I think you're all really strong and you're standing up for this monk school. Holy. I mean, you know, that's just disgusting. Good luck. Go us up. So, if you need a flag, we'll be there. No. I'm told that we have three minutes. Are there any final questions before we wrap up? Wrap up? Um, can I the hand in the back, please? And please keep it to a minute so that we can get the other two. Just want to make sure that I have to run up to a couple of minutes. I don't know if there's any questions or challenges that are addressing somehow. I still. I think that we need to have more debate around some of the issues, you know, because I understand where, and I've been around for these years, and we always have the challenge of, on one side, is a very strong nationalist tendency within the Iranian community here. Uh, and also we have to realize that the Iranian community is not a homogenous community. I mean, there's a strong class-based tendency in terms of very, a certain percentage of community coming from upper class background and technocrats and all that, you know, which they bring also their own way of looking at things. And not everyone is necessarily political or refugee. Uh, so I, I want to, but also the challenge of two of the years of not being able, among the left in Canada, not being able to actually separate political Islam mm -hmm. from uh, those who Muslim 
as their religion. And the political Islam, the Islamic Republic of Iran is, is a political Islam, but also as I argued in my case, that, uh, in my presentation, that there is also a capitalist neoliberal regime uh, in, in every, every possible sense. So how to actually, for us, as the UN committee here, engaging this struggle for social justice movement, and also for equity, but also in solidarity with other movement. But at the same time, progressive movements here understanding that uh, also everyone who says they're to uh, imperialism, they're to US, they're not really anti imperialist David McNally argued as well. Okay. I Thank think that we should have more Thank you for the question. Um, and we had another hand uh, at the back. Yeah, uh, can you pass it to Raho, please? We'll make that the last question, just because I was told I had three minutes, three minutes ago. <laughs> I would like to make a very brief comment, and uh, it's not a comment of this agreement, but a way of continuing uh, our conversation about the challenges that we face when it comes to doing solidarity work in respect of Iran. And I'd like to thank uh, Hassan for uh, giving the example of refugees, because I think that's a very good inquiry point. Of this, for this conversation. It points to the challenges because of the uh, selectiveness that we see in the approach of the Iranian government to the issue of persecution. And I think uh, it's uh, important when we discuss this issue and other similar matters that we question that double standard. We don't need to downplay the persecution that LGBT minorities face in Iran or uh, the other the problems that women face, and in fact, maybe in some ways, they could be greater problems than, for example, the problems that LGBTs might face in Mexico, but it doesn't trivialize the terrible persecution that Mexican LGBTs face, and it's important not to uh, hierarchize the levels of oppression that people face, and in fact, create ties between them, and I think it's a very good uh, they are thinking about how we can uh, bring these different communities together, maybe uh, maybe try to engage with Iranians who have not been reported and try to use, uh, try to encourage them to urge the Iranian government to show this, the urge the Canadian government to uh, also show the same level of respect to other communities. And, uh, Thank you, Rahul. I'm okay. sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, I cut you off. <laughs> All right, do we have any um, final remarks from the panelists? No? Um, I, think, I think, yes, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and I absolutely think that even within progressive movements, um, we haven't figured out how to separate different kinds of Islam. But Islam is practices, and Islam is um, association, Islam. Uh, you know, people talk about um, Islamophobia as a new form of racism, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're even practicing. Um, so there's multiple layers here. So yes, how do we separate all these versions of Islam? And so in this climate where people can't understand, um, criticisms of Iran are obviously going to become seen as become a part of this broader conversation. Obviously, it's not our entire responsibility to constantly be um, speaking in nuances, but I think there are particular moments where and when those conversations happen that become critical. So when happening, um, I use the example of the refugee rights movement of anti deportation because these are conversations that are happening in the mainstream media. And we can see how Iran's being um, talked about in, in a very singular fashion, right? And there's, you know, often you see people separating Iran, like pe the mainstream media will talk about Iran, but also use the word Iranians, right? Like they're just uh, Iranians are homophobic. Right, like, and then which are it, right? So there is this like constant. Um, it, it melts. It melts between different places. And I agree with you. I think we need to um, we need to build a broad um, migrant justice like, on this question, migrant justice movement that spans um, across national borders, right? Like we need to talk about what it, there is currently a huge campaign to have a moratorium on deportations to Iran. I mean, I'm like, yes, there should be a moratorium to deportations to all countries, and there should be status for all undocumented people here, right? And then simultaneously, that doesn't mean we want to have people come here and displace indigenous people or be continue to be complicit in a settler project, right? So it's it's walking those balances, um, um, both at the level of strategy, but also at the level of how we speak about these things. Um, so without hierarchizing them, as you put it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks. Um, any other final comments? Or we're okay. All right. Um, I know we have closing remarks by uh, somebody. That would be me. Um, and just a reminder, uh, before we go after the closing remarks, to please take the cups and the plates um, that you brought in with you um, and throw them in the garbage or the second the Okay, so thank you very much to the uh, speakers for today. Thank you for the questions. And Folks, uh, so my name is Bezal Samadhi, as, as I've mentioned before. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and You're I'm going to conclude today's program. Well, my fellow organizers have been kind enough to ask that I, that I uh, conclude today's uh, program on a note of thanks. And after all, many thanks are due. To begin with, uh, we'd like to thank you, the audience, for taking time out of your, uh, of your lives to, to be here today. Uh, in the middle of a weekend, and this thing they're calling the Arctic Vortex. Not anymore. You know, if somebody had told us several months ago that you're going to be hosting this event in the middle of a winter that is so cold that a whole new category of cold is going to be invented, <laughs> we might have we might have reconsidered the day. But seriously, uh, and you know, on a more on a more serious note, let me also say that uh, we take for granted uh, we take for granted that events like this. Um, can be a bumpy, awkward affair. We take for granted that we're going to encounter, we're like, you know, likely to encounter uh, opinions, arguments, positions, ideologies that might not be commensurate or reflective or with our own, uh, our own experiences, or our own priorities. Um, but you know, I just wanted to point out that my fellow organizers and I, we don't take for granted the fact that, knowing this, many of you nevertheless decided to show up. So thank you for that. And in fact, I'd like also th to thank the folks in the audience who may uh, may have remained skeptical and, and posed those difficult questions. As as the panelists were, uh, you know, pointed out, uh, the conversation continues, right? And what better way to, to conclude an event? Um, we'd also like to thank the organizations without whose support, financial and logistical, this event would have been less likely, if not altogether impossible. And here I'm thinking of uh, OPRIC Toronto, OPRIC York, QP Ontario, and QP National. And also the, um, the uh, Persian uh, weekly newspaper, Shahman, for, uh, for taking the liberty of, um, for, you know, for their generosity in allowing us to advertise without charge. So thank you for that. Um, and of course our panelists, no shortage of thanks is owed to them for lending their voices to ours, uh, some of them on very, very short notice. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we'd also like to thank in particular those among our panelists who crossed borders to be here today and in doing so embodied some of the themes that we've been discussing today. Um, finally, our volunteers, short notice once again, but nevertheless, here you are helping us with the uh, logistical and at times physical heavy lifting. Am I missing anybody here? No? Okay, so on that note, let me just once again reiterate the, the, the points that so many of our panelists have been making over the, the last uh, day. <laughs> uh, the conversation continues, and so please, you know, if, if, uh, if you feel that with the limited resources that we had at our disposal, we did not sufficiently cover a particular area of debate, a particular subject matter, something that you think is pertinent or should be, you know, uh, the subject of further conversation, please let us know. Our contact information is available online, that's iraninreview.com. You may uh, proceed to contact us via Facebook, via Twitter. We would really like to hear from you, because after all, my co-organizers, uh, and I think I speak on behalf of the panelists as well, we don't regard today's event as a one-off, as some kind of flash in the pan or isolated incident. In the best of scenarios, we do hope to reproduce something like this some other day to address those issues that we weren't able to sufficiently focus upon given our uh, limited resources. So for that reason, we would really, really welcome any feedback, constructive criticism, uh, any other kind of criticism. We'd like to hear from you. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you for coming.